Welcome back to another episode of Unhinged History with your host, me, Tani, arguably unhinged as well. Today is a f- today is an exciting episode. Why? Because it's a little bit of her story or like my history, i.e. it's a it's surrounding my dad's career. Okay. Now, if you've followed me for some time, you probably may remember the little mini series that I did do on dad's career as a saturation diver. However, it is constantly requested. Nay, ba- like I'm, ba- I'm constantly badgered to get him on to tell more stories. And so I'm going to do that. We have, this will be episode one of an interview series, okay? So episode two, we'll have him on it. The reason I'm doing this episode first is to explain what the hell is saturation diving. And when I say basically it's an upside down astronaut instead of being in space, it's under the water. I'm going to explain all that so that when I interview dad and he uses lingo and whatnot, you'll be able to understand what on earth he's talking about. And at the end of this, I will be telling stories that he has given me as the like industry stories that every single person knows. And so I will be telling those historical stories after I explain what sat diving is, the history around it. Then I'll be doing the horrible history of the worst accidents, arguably. So if you want to stick around, do it. Let's cue the music. Mm-hmm. I would like to pour my heart out, tell you all how much I love you for the support on the podcast. I have, I'm making it a habit to read out a couple of beautiful comments and I think we're over 12,000, yeah, 12,000 subscribers. Oh my gosh, guys. Thank you for that. That's for you guys. Caitlin Griffin, thank you so much. A YouTube reviewer. I learned so much and I absolutely want to try all the existing bananas after the banana cartel. Absolutely agree. I also would like to try all the existing bananas, including the blue ones. That's my, that I would, that's on the list. So thank you so much for that. And (laughs) this one from Shawnee Mick on iTunes. Came over from TikTok and I love this. Random thoughts. Would love to hear more about area of expertise and suggestions. And there were some suggestions that you left. I love that so much. Thank you. And thank you for the five stars on Apple Podcasts. It means the world. Just, yeah, grateful. Thank you. Now, that that's, that, that thing's done. Okay, cool. On to the next. Today's sponsor is still myself. But instead of highlighting the uh, my jewelry brand, which is a Caesar, which is historical based and symbolic jewelry. I instead am going to highlight my paid subscription based platform. There's a few ways that you can join. I'll put a little thing on the on the screen of the different ways that you can join. You can join via Patreon or you can join via YouTube. And hopefully at the point of me like showing the screenshot, there'll be other ways that you can join too. Anyway, the point is that it's a Discord server. It's a private Discord community. We do every other week on Australian Friday morning, American Thursday evening. It's called Thirsty Thursdays because most of my peoples are American or in the Northern Hemisphere. And it's basically a let's catch up as a group of friendly nerd friends that have a lot in common and talk about all things history, science, mental health, life, and just, just it's a community. It's paid because I do share a lot of personal stuff in there that I don't typically, that I won't share publicly. And it's a great time. So I would highly, if you're looking for, honestly, I've made lifelong friends. And I know that sounds really cheesy, but it's true. Lifelong friends via the internet realm, 
and then that but it is there's that level of privacy because it is a pay community so the people that are there have to accept, you get what I'm saying so if that is of interest to you it really does help support the channel it's really fun you can meet new people and we're always up for a wild conversation so that's that look whilst I sponsor this podcast myself I edit it I film it whatever we're we'll just very open to sponsors. I'm just going to put that out there, okay? Because the production level is, it is what it is, okay? Why don't we get started? Let's dive in, literally, pun intended, to the world of saturation diving and the ocean. Like I said, the reason that I have a personal history connection with saturation diving is because my dad did it for 25 years. He was a diver good kind of insane that I feel like I inherited. I am my father's daughter. Anyone that knows the two of us will agree. His name is Tane. I'm Tani. And anyway, so you may have seen the previous videos that I've done with him. Mainly on TikTok, I did do one interview, but it's pretty poor quality on my YouTube. So we're going to, when I bring them on, we're going to go over a few of the stories we have covered before, but a lot of stories that he hasn't spoken about. But today we're going to talk about what the hell it is. What is saturation diving? What is this under what is this underwater world that is isolating and horrifying in every sense of the world? Word. What? So 70% of our planet is covered in salt water, right? The ocean. The big blue. But we have a better map of Mars, like the planet Mars, than we do of our oceans. So we know more about space than we do about our very own ocean, which virtually sustains or at some point has sustained every single living thing on Earth. Sure, space is great, but deep sea exploration? crazy crazy and very difficult deep sea exploration is very complicated and it has a really interesting history and some horror stories so we're going to get into that quinauts if you will that makes it sound less intense anyway so what is it let us begin there what is saturation diving what is she saying what is what do those words mean essentially Exploring the very, very depths of the ocean is the idea. And it was built by a French firm. So the whole concept of this was led by a French firm, Comex, okay? Basically, they were like, huh, I wonder if we could stick men, um, I wonder how much, how many, how long we could put them under the waterfall until they like explode. We should test that. They did, and they started this whole project. The U.S. Navy also had their little bit to play, but it was led, I think, primarily by the French. There was a few parties involved. So the issue with diving, if, if not familiar, I myself, being raised by a saturation diver, was into scuba as soon as I was able to, okay? Even if you've been scuba diving, even if you've been in a pool, and if you haven't been in a pool, if you've been in an aeroplane, You'll understand the pressure difference, right? You know, when you get to that certain pressure and your ears start to... That's because we're land animals and being underwater, the volume of water, it, it puts pressure onto us that we can't handle naturally, okay? So when you like dive deep or when you're scuba diving, you have to decompress and then you have to come back up, right? So saturation diving is like going beyond all common sense and putting people at the literal bottom of the ocean. So the first saturation dive took place in 1938. So, you know, it's it, quite some time ago. A guy named Edgar and a guy named Max Knoll spent 27 hours at the depth of 30 metres 
which is 101 feet for the Americans. That's a school, that's three school buses, okay? Just imagine a school bus, which is about 10 meters, but then put it vertically and stack them on top of each other. That was the first one in 1938, and they spent 27 hours down there. They were breathing air, oxygen, which is made up of a lot of ni nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide, and depends where you are. So then, about 20 years later, this guy called George Bond, not James Bond, but George Bond, conducted something called the Genesis Project, which already sounds like a horror movie, in my opinion. And he wanted to prove that humans could withstand pressure and prolonged exposure to different types of gases. So he wanted to prove that human beings could breathe in something other than oxygen or a mix of higher levels of some other gas for a prolonged period and be fine. Okay. That was his hypothesis. And that hypothesis in the US Navy were like, that's a brilliant idea. Let's test that. Cool. Let's go. Well, let's expose humans to, to potentially toxic gases. <laughs> that sounds fun. Anyway, so they get to work and they realize that the hypothesis is viable. And it took a solid 10 years. So we're talking about 1960 now, 65. The, but they performed the very first saturation dive. Okay, what does that mean? A guy named Bennett invented a breathing gas to eliminate the high pressure that when you're under the water and there's tons and tons and tons of pressure on you and then you die, he worked out, like he said, hold on a minute. If we get people to be breathing and be completely in all their cells and tissues, completely saturated, in a lighter gas and they can breathe that and they can live, then like the pressure wouldn't be so bad, right? I guess think about a helium balloon versus an oxygen balloon. I, like an oxygen balloon. Actually, that's a bad analogy. It's the other way around. Point is, this fan dude was like, let's see what happens if we give them he helium and stuff because it will make them lighter, and so the pressure won't be so bad. Um, and so that, that kind of worked. There were casualties. I keep trying to Google like the ethicalness of these experiments, and I can't really find a lot, which says a lot. When you can't find a lot, it says a lot about the volunteers. What happened to them? I don't know. Couldn't tell you because it's not publicly. Point is that they worked out with the Atlantis 3 experiment, meaning that there was two beforehand that we don't talk about, subjecting volunteers to a pressure of 2,250 FSW. Don't know what that means. 686 meters? I don't know. The point is that exposing somebody to this trimix of gas that was very helium-based for 31 plus days, and it set a world record. Go Bennett. So then they were like, okay, cool. So what's the point of this? That's great. But how are we going to make any money off that? And they're like, science. And then, but then, but then guess what? You know what's on the bottom of the ocean floor? A shit ton of oil and gas. That's right, oil and gas industry. They come on in and they say, ha, we can use people that could live at the bottom of the ocean for up to two months without blah, 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 because then they could help us fix our oil piping. Because like when I was in, okay, side quest, just for a second, just a little while. I won my year eight science fair. I'm proud of that. And I did my science experiment Literally, this was it. It was a video on peak oil, okay? So you know how you see those videos of people like striking gold and like the oil spurts out, okay? That's when there's plenty of oil so that it's spurting out. 
But then when it gets to the midpoint, like this drink bottle, it doesn't spurt out anymore, right? They put it under pressure. That is not going to come out the top. So it needs to be sucked out. So he said. Essentially, that that was the that's the case in a lot of the under the sea the situations when it comes to oil. So they needed to get big sucky things. That's definitely the scientific term, and suck out the oil. But they needed people at this stage because robots or remote operated vehicles (ROVs) were not as advanced that in this time period. So they, they, then the oil and gas industry were like. Hello, you can keep men down there? <laughs> then enters the saturation or the commercial diving industry because now money, you get the point. So basically the commercial diving is linked to offshore, meaning oil that's in the ocean off the shoreline and extracting that. And in the history of it, it really began in the North Sea. The procedures and equipment for sat diving, this is where things go batshit insane. And we will cover that in more detail, but I'm just going to get out the, chron the chronology for you so that you know where we're sitting, okay? Diving support infrastructures started being built, again, because we've got money on our side now. And North Sea drilling attracted divers to the Gulf of Mexico, oil fields, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then the U.S. Navy started to get back in and interested again. And anyway, the procedures that were developed, and let's be frank, they were developed when accidents happened. Anyway, helium, breathing helium. By the 1990s, there was a lot of accidents that we are going to call back. And as of, I guess, 2017, the saturation diving industry is kind of a little bit dead. It's not dead entirely, but we have ro robotics now. So that's a really broad overview of the history and an explanation of what it is. But I guess, what is the experience? You probably are like, okay, well, that's it. Oh, cool. So basically what happens is there is, let, hang on, let me just quickly, let, give me a sec, hold on, wait a minute. So according to published data, I struggled. approximately, that's fine. Statistically speaking, saturation diving is one of the, was one of the most dangerous jobs because again, we're talking like around like from the 60s through to the 2000 and I think my dad got out in 2015. And as the years went on, it got safer, if you will. But if we're talking about the North Sea Alliance, which is this where it began, the divers, where there was about 400 of them on the offshore rigs, most of them had severe injury, risk of death, and a lot of them died. 56 of them confirmed dead. Some were never found. And then 90% of them were in life-threatening situations within their work, which checks out. Dad, almost every trip, almost died, which is great. 85% of those who survived suffered from decompression sickness, which is a medical thing we'll go over. And necrosis, pulmonary disease, cancer. And 30% of them had been diagnosed with a brain injury. And 96% of the ones that had been studied said that their quality of life been significantly reduced and then 23 of them had have actually committed suicide from that group and that this is like the pioneering this is the 65s era okay my dad was born was my dad born in 65 yeah that was he he was born huh there you go it's not easy nor is it fun the, the fun not at all i'm assuming you have super probably what with what is it so this is like how it goes so well, this is how I know it because this is my anecdotal secondhand. Well, this is my experience as a child of a sat diver. So for basically most of the saturation divers in the 90s, 2000s, whatever, would be contractors. They would go off and acquire a contract 
for an area where they had an oil rig set up. And we're talking about multi, multi, multi million dollar like BP, Exxon, et cetera, et cetera. They, and a rig is the thing that sits on top of the water, okay? That's where the, all this stuff happens. And so most jobs would be like either 30 through to 60 days long. Now, they would put five to nine men in a chamber, a saturation chamber, that the air is this mix of heliot gas or whatever it is, which is mainly helium. Basically, their entire tissue and like muscle and all that stuff has to be completely saturated so that they are literally in what would be comparable to an international space station kind of hub. So they're acclimatized at this level. They, they live in this bell and they then dive and do either construction or demolition work, okay? So welding, fixing things, installing things that are required to suck oil out of the ground. Okay, naturally my camera and microphone decided to die at exactly the same time. So let's just pick up where I think we left off, which was like what they actually did under there. So they were installing gear, demolishing gear, like sucking oil out of the bed of the ocean is a pretty big deal. So there's a lot of work to do. And then they would go about their day, pitch black, under the ocean, right? Now, if you don't know much about the ocean, it's pretty intense, just waist deep currents, the storms, sea animals. So as much as the work, as my dad would put it, wasn't technical, Frankly, I don't know how to weld, so sounds technical to me, but it was more the experience, right? After a day's work, they would then come back up into this, the saturated, pressurized bell and sleep on bunks with their five to nine mates. Now, might I also add that the type of people that do this kind of thing, mostly extreme individuals. My dad worked with a lot of ex-Navy SEALs, a lot of ex-military people, a lot of ex-assassins, literally. My dad is a, was a, a married dad of three, and he only ever knew of one other guy that, that was in a marriage and that had kids. And weirdly enough, everyone that he knew in saturation diving only ever had daughters, and they think it's some pressure thing to do with the cells, whatever. Yeah, basically they are in this, if, if you just think of an international space station, but instead of in space, it's under the ocean. More terrifying in my opinion, because at least in space, there's no like sharks and octopi and odd things that saturation divers can't actually explain. Okay. And like I said, they would just live down there do that day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out until the job was done. And then they would slowly over about four days, decompress, desaturate to somewhat normal oxygen levels. But because they'd been breathing in this mix of like mostly helium gas so that the pressure didn't compress their existence, they would all have Donald Duck voices and other questions that I would always have is okay sure but dad when you're working in Russia isn't that cold and he'd be like yeah absolutely you would get hypothermia and so I'd be like so how does that work and he'd be like oh the suits are heated with like heated water and if the heating turns off you die instantly of hypothermia cool so there's a lot of moving parts I feel like yeah there's a lot and so basically when the divers are down there they have this like tube thing, this connection to air and whatever. And they wear these, the big helmets, insert picture you might be familiar with. And that's their life. That's literally their lifeline. And if something goes wrong upstairs, gone. So that's a day, that's a day to day. Okay. And then they would get back on land. 
And for the risk, it was good money. But again, it was contract. It was a contract thing. So people were always chasing the contracts. And you can only do that for so long. And a lot of the guys that were in the jobs, they didn't have families. And so they would get on land and just, you know, whereas dad would fly home to his three daughters and be domestic. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know how he did it. So moving forward, now that like what the day in and day out is, there's a few things that you need to know about diving, about being under the ocean. I'm an ocean girlie, grew up on the coast. Taught us well. Decompression sick, D, DCS, decompression sickness, is a fatal condition. It's basically when bubbles of inert gas in a diver's body ascend to the brain, gone. That happens pretty regularly. Even in, even in scuba diving, even just in diving, not even that deep. Again, we're talking like meters and meters under the ocean, right? There's high pressure nervous system disorder where the helium oxygen mixture can like stop you breathing. There's compression arthialgia, which is when the pressure basically kills you. Necrosis, bone necrosis, the depth effects can basically give you this inability to breathe almost like a de a facial ver a facial version of claustrophobia again because remember they're living in bells and then they're going deep into the ocean and neurological symptoms because breathing gas mixtures probably i don't know oxygen toxicity is another thing so too much oxygen after being completely saturated with other forms of gases is a thing. And there's been like a huge study into lung issues. Anyway, we're not going to tell dad about that. But anyway, there's also just general injuries because being at the bottom of the ocean, like my dad's stories are insane. Every single trip, he was attacked by some sea animal or he had a friend that died or whatever. There was that time, that one time where a guy had a pimple on his leg and then it turned into somebody losing his jaw because of the environment being highly helium based and therefore the staph infection killed everybody. Didn't kill everybody. Didn't kill anyone, but one guy lost his leg and one guy lost his jaw. Point is, it's insane. I would argue more insane than an astronaut, but that's just me. His stories are uh, arguably as crazy as the stories I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to give a trigger warning right now. Hmm. This is horrible history. There is death, and not just death, there is like kind of the worst ways you could die. So if that's something that you're not ready to stomach, I would suggest turning it off and not listening to it. I probably should give myself a trigger warning because like, I realize now as an adult, like a lot of reasons for some of the things that I do because I was the eldest daughter and dad would tell me a lot of these stories. But arguably there's probably like three to four to five too many incidences in the saturation diving world where everybody who's in it knows the stories, okay? The first being the Bifford Dolphin diving belt accident where essentially the victims of this accident, their blood was boiled in their bodies and they were boiled alive from the inside. On the bifold dolphin situation, again, first of it's like insane, in, never before seen engineering, right? The crew was of 102 people and they were diving at 460 meters deep, which is 100. 1,500 feet. That is mm, 46 school buses, right? That's half a kilometer. That's like a quarter of a mile into the ocean. Anyway, so basically what happened is the rig ran and they're in the North Sea, treacherous. North Sea, not a vibe. It's whatever. All, so the, on March, on the 1st of March in 1976, the rig ran around and all the crew were evacuated, but six people died when they fell out of their boats. So that was that incident. 
Then there was a diving bell incident, okay? And this is the main one. So on on the 5th of November, 1983, before my dad's time, at 4 a.m. while drilling the in the Norwegian sector of the North Sea, which is cold. I'm going to put a very primitive photo in it so that you can see where I'm getting at. And I really apologize if you're on the listening platform. I'll try to explain it. The connection that was made to the trunk is kept sealed by a clamp. Think about a big rubber band, okay? So the diving bell, the chambers are separate from, the, from where the divers go into the bell and then they come out and they dive. That clamp is extremely important because it keeps the pressurized pressure at the pressurized amount of pressure it needs to be in the pressure. Mm. Anyway, mm. all these divers were very experienced. They were doing extremely routine stuff, okay? So, the, so there's two divers out diving, right? And then there's two divers, so there's six in total, two divers diving. Two divers in chamber two and two divers in chamber one, six in total. So the guys out doing their stuff should have come in into the diving bell at the bottom, closed the bell door, and that would have then opened to the trunk. Then they were supposed to slightly increase the pressure in the diving bell to seal the bell door and then close chamber one door and then slowly decompressorize the trunk, okay? And then finally, they would open the clamp to separate the diving bell from the chamber system. The first two steps were completed, but for an unknown reason, Cramond opened the clamp that was keeping the rest of the trunk sealed before the other diver could close the other door. So he opened the door too fast, basically. Didn't really follow instruction, apparently. And this resulted in the chamber being explosively decompressed, right? So from a pressure of nine atmospheres, it is it, that it went from decompression to nine atmospheres. That's why I think this is crazy than space. One atmosphere of the unsealed chamber and the air rushed out of it so they were literally starved of, of any air. And all of those four divers were instantly were killed, right? In the autopsy, when they looked at the divers, four of them, obviously, most notably, died of the pressure and basically just imploded. But what is even more horrifying is the other two, so that was four of the divers, the other two divers their blood started boiling inside of their body and killed them from the inside out. Their blood boiled them to death because of the intense decompression explosion. Basically, one of the divers' body was it, it exploded into fragments. Okay. All the internal organs, all of the small intestine, and they projected some distance. One section being found 10 meters vertically. Small intestines found 10 meters vertically because he exploded that aggressively. So yeah, that's a pretty bad one. Not gonna lie. That's a very well known one. Then there are others which I think I'm gonna like leave it's a dad to tell because I he's been in these he's been in situations exactly like these other stories. The only one I will tell is the one that dad said I must tell on this podcast, which is The Last Breath. Now, The Last Breath is actually a film. It's a, document, a documentary. And if you don't want a plot spoiler, then subscribe and dip on out now. I can't watch it because this has happened to my dad twice. But essentially, it's a sort of documentary about the Bibi Topaz diving incident, which at that point, my dad was out of the water. I don't know why he likes this movie, but he's, that's what, he's like, the movie capt it captures it so well. I'm like, <laughs> okay, that's terrifying. But anyway, and it's basically about when the umbilical cable, so that thing that connects the divers, gets severed and they become trapped 100 metres under the sea 
and they don't have any heat, they don't have any light, they only have very minimal breathing gas in the backup tank. And yeah, it talks about the positioning, the oxygen, and yeah, this, again, this is this very, this almost identical situation has happened to my dad twice. He survived it, obviously. But the other thing that it doesn't go into is like being dragged. So obviously if you're enough connected, bleh, connected on an umbilical and there's wild seas, then you're just like being dragged. Anyway, I'm going to let him tell those stories because he'll tell them better, I think. Maybe not. I don't know. But at least you now know what saturation diving is and some of the more horrifying stories. Again, I would tell more, but dad has better stories. That's awful. Holy crap. Does it explain a little bit more about my personality now? That's my dad. I hope it does. I hope you enjoy. I hope you learned something today. The craziest, one of the craziest professions of all time. Saturation diving and the history of it. Now, please subscribe for episode two once I capture my father and get him into this interview room. And I will let him tell you all the horrible facts about the ocean, about sat diving, but also the creatures, they're next level. If you are interested, there is a series on my TikTok and I do have one YouTube video. It's just not very good quality. So I don't know. You can just wait for the next one. Thank you so much. Please love, subscribe, review, etc, etc. If you enjoyed this, if you learned something and I'll see you next time.